Alana Molstein, registered dietitian nutritionist and host of Living Healthy Living Well on EmpowerMe.tv. In today's episode, we're going to be delving into dining out and explore how you can still go to your favorite restaurants without compromising your healthy lifestyle. I will also be bringing on Deborah Benaim, a chef in Los Angeles who's acclaimed for her wonderful cooking. One thing to note when dining out is if you are calorie conscious and you're trying to count your calories and you look up at a restaurant's calorie count, you can't really rely on those numbers. The reason why is because the FDA gives restaurants about a 20% leeway in the calorie estimation. That's why when you see a 100 calorie pack of Oreos, you might wonder, how is that exactly 100 calories? Well, actually, it could be about 119 and still be okay. Now, to let you know why this can be a little bit dangerous is if some person needs about 2,000 calories a day to maintain his weight and he eats just 5% more than that every day, that could lead to a 10-pound weight gain in a single year. So it's always a really good idea when dining out to kind of overestimate how many calories are in each meal. One tip I love for dining out is to eat really clean. And by clean, I mean eating in its most natural form. Because if you are trying to estimate the calorie content of a food, or you're trying to go back to our first episode and keep the my plate image in mind, it's much easier to do that if you order a grilled piece of salmon, a steamed baked potato, steamed or baked potato, and sauteed spinach. There's not that much leeway that can go on, aside from maybe a little butter in the preparation of the spinach and salmon. Whereas if you're gonna get something like a deep fried macaroni and cheese ball, who knows what's in something like that? So my best tip is to go ahead and order clean as your main entree and rely on bites from friends and family if you really want that one bite. Because if you want something decadent like fettuccine alfredo or something else like that, we really don't need a whole bowl because by the fourth or fifth bite, we tend to not even really be tasting or eating really. We tend to just be mindlessly consuming. So it helps to get something like a big, nice steak salad and rely on little bites to get all the good taste from the restaurant's cuisine. Now one tip we really need to keep in mind is that first bite of the meal itself. Studies have shown that if your first bite is a carbohydrate, like the bread that they have at Italian restaurants or tortilla chips that they have at Mexican restaurants or long breadsticks at maybe French or other Italian restaurants, if you start your meal with a bite of one of those carbohydrates, studies have shown that you're more likely to eat more carbohydrates, less protein, less vegetables, and more overall in that meal which is very strategic on the part of the restaurants because if they give you a little cheap bread at the start of the meal, that means that you're gonna be more likely to order a heavy carbohydrate dish, something like a penne pasta that might be cheaper than the salmon but is a much bigger markup for them. And because you're gonna be eating more overall, now you're more likely to order an appetizer, maybe even a dessert. So it's always a good idea to make your first bite First, a cup of water, if you can. So that's the first thing we always want to fill up on because studies have shown that people who have water at the start of the meal tend to have better weight management throughout the course of their life. But we really want to be going for a vegetable as the first thing you eat because we always tend to go back for our first bite. The first thing that we ate is what we tend to go back to. So if your first bite is a vegetable, you are more likely to consume more vegetables in the meal as opposed to that carbohydrate one. So if you go to a restaurant and they have a really good spinach artichoke dip, but they serve it with a big loaf of white bread, try asking the waiter if he can bring out some celery sticks or carrot sticks. They usually use them as garnishes or as the base for a soup or salad. Ask if they could bring those out and you can actually snack on the celery sticks and carrot sticks with the spinach artichoke dip and your water to start your meal rather than the bread. Also, going back to our first episode on healthy everyday eating, one thing we really talked about was visually cutting your plate in half and making sure that over 50% of your meal is consumed with vegetables. So if you think about it, half our plate should be vegetables. That's the majority in the food category breakdown of the plate. 
So when you order a steak from the restaurant and it's a huge load of meat and there's just a few string beans on the side and a big dollop of mashed potatoes, that ratio and that my plate image aren't really working out for each other. So it might make sense to order a steak salad because essentially what we have to be doing is eating mostly vegetables with the proteins and carbohydrates on the side. So when you get something like a steak salad, you can get a big bowl of veggies, top it off with a good amount of steak, and maybe still enjoy a piece of bread or dessert to get in that good carbohydrate category. Now going back to ordering salads, they're not always as innocent as they seem. And the way where they can get really sneaky is when they have a lot of the extras. So just like we spoke about in the first episode, we don't want to go for a lot of the extras when it comes to the sugar and fats. And when you have things like sweetened craisins and sweetened cranberries and a lot of dried fruits and a lot of fried noodles and a super creamy dressing, it can throw an innocent salad way off. So if you're going to be ordering a salad, I recommend if you know there are going to be a lot of crunchies or fried toppings, asking for that on the side and also asking for the dressing on the side. When it comes to dressing, there are two great tips. Most of my clients like tip one, and that is keeping the dressing on the side, taking your fork, dipping it first into the dressing, and then into the salad, and then taking a bite. This way you're guaranteeing that there's dressing on every single bite, but by the end, you'll find a ton of extras left in the dressing cup. Personally, I don't like to use that trick because I find it's socially awkward if I'm with a big group of people and I'm doing this whole fork technique. So what I like to do is with my dressing on the side, I like to ask the waiter to bring me a plate of lemons. When he brings me a plate of lemons, I take the lemons and I squeeze them into the creamy dressing, maybe something like ranch. This way I'm adding a little more liquid, water, and a good zest in the lemons, plus an added kick of vitamin C. This way I'll stir in the creamy dressing, now diluted with a little bit of lemon juice, and it really thins out that dressing. Now when I pour that dressing over my salad, it doesn't just goop on a few big pieces of lettuce, it actually spreads more evenly throughout the salad bowl, and you find that when you're done with the salad, there's a big pool of a lot of extra dressing because it's been liquefied and it doesn't just stay on the lettuce. The gravity pulls it and you get a good amount of extras at the bottom, which is a great way to save calories without having to look different to your friends. In general, when we go to restaurants, we do want to enjoy ourselves and be able to go out with our friends and order some of our favorite foods. But we can make some good variations by talking with the waiter or maybe calling ahead and seeing if they can make any adjustments for us. Some really good examples is, as Deborah might tell us a little bit later in the episode, is when they cook steaks, they tend to base that in a lot of butter. So you can maybe call ahead or discuss with the waiter, is there a possibility that you can grill my steak instead of basting it in the pan? Because it's really just as flavorful, now you're getting the added flavors from the grill, and it's a really great way to save a lot of the extra fat. So we want to be looking for things like grilled, really helps to get things steamed. So if you want to order the steamed spinach, really helps to you know, make sure they're steaming it. Because sometimes they say steamed, but then once they steam it, they saute it in a lot of more butter and garlic. So we really want to be vocal. We want to be our own advocates when we go to restaurants. Because ultimately, we need to look at the menu as a suggestion. Because the restaurant wants you to be happy. And if you're waddling out of there, feeling really full of guilt and full of fat and salt, you're not going to be very happy. So it's a great idea, call ahead, speak with the waiter privately if it's embarrassing for you, and make sure that they can make these adjustments for you so you can leave the restaurant feeling satisfied and happy and empowered by your choices and not left feeling overwhelmed by all the extra calories and fat you just consumed. And then finally, we need to remember that value meals are not necessarily valuable to us. Although we feel like we're getting a good bang for our buck because we're getting two more fries or something of, as ridiculous as that, and it's called value meal, we need to be thinking a little more long term. So yes, in that 30 seconds, we feel like we just got a really good deal. But later, when you realize you didn't need that much food, you're gonna realize that was not a valuable decision in your long-term health. 
So we need to remember value meals are not valuable to us. And it really pays to think smarter when dining out and making good choices. One great way to add value to your meal is order a dish and ask them to split it and put it in a put half of it in a goodie bag for you to take home. That's a real good value because now you're paying for one entree, but it's lasting two meals because you can have it for lunch the next day. So we need to think a little more savvy about what it means to get a good value and getting a lot of vegetables and good proteins and good healthy whole grains prepared for you in a really nice clean way is a great value to your overall health. Now I'm pleased to introduce our guest, Deborah Benaim. She's a Venezuelan-born chef and owner of her own catering company, DB Catering. Deborah is also a former chef at Spago Beverly Hills, Wolfgang Puck's legendary flagship restaurant. Her extensive traveling has given her experience with many cuisines, and she accommodates many diets, including kosher, gluten-free, and otherwise. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> I'm always shocked at how much butter they use on those cooking shows when they're preparing vegetables and steak. Being that you're a restaurant and catering expert, can you tell us what other foods to look out for for sneaky butter and fat? Okay, chefs, we love butter. Butter is like the ultimate tool in the kitchen. Uh, I would say the biggest thing is risotto. Risotto is one of those things that we love to just add chunks and chunks of butter because it adds that creaminess. The arborio rice is already very creamy, but there's really nothing like the essence of butter for that dish. So I would, I would say that, you know, there's certain things that butter enhances. Uh, another thing is steak. Steak right. basted in butter because it really gets into those nooks and crannies, you know, and gets that really crispy outer layer. It's so funny because home cooks, I don't find to even think about using butter with steak, but on those cooking shows, it's like... I mean, I could go into the scientific process of why it works and why, you know, but it just, it's one of those things. So if you're really looking out to sort of be a little more conscious about your, your weight or, you know, your health, I would look out for dishes like that. Okay, good. That's a good one. I would not have thought about the risotto. So for some home cooks out there, are there any spices or other cooking methods you can recommend that add a lot of flavor without needing as much fat? Yeah, definitely. I remember in my first stage and in the restaurant world, that means when you kind of go into that, you know, kitchen for the very, very first time and you're young and the chefs come, come to you and try to mentor you. and. One of the very first things that he taught me in Dallas was that there's this thing called umami, and umami packs a whole lot of flavor. Umami can be found in things like soy, nutritional yeast, garlic, and what's the mushrooms. definition of umami for umami, those who don't know? Umami, it's, it's kind of like that, that you know, sixth sense. It's that, that flavor profile you quite can't put your finger on, you know, that you kind of are trying to describe to someone else, but you can't find the right it's words. It's a sense of savoriness a little bit, right? Very savory, correct. Um, and also very, you know, otherworldly in my opinion. You know, what is the, a mushroom tastes like a mushroom, tastes like a mushroom. Is there anything else in the world that tastes like a mushroom? No, so that has a lot of umami. Same okay, thing with good. soy. That's how I guess I would best describe it. And so that helps in replacing fat? Definitely helps in re replacing fat. Um, it helps in packing in a lot of flavor. Um, I think fat is important for cooking mm -hmm. uh, technique-wise, but you don't have to have, you know, fat in order to have a wonderful meal that has a lot of flavor and, you know, is really something that you look forward to eating at the end of the day, you know, right. when you come home from work. So, so maybe like when making a stir fry, more soy sauce and maybe mushrooms in the mix correct I rather do than that. so much oil yeah or you know a lot of herbs i i often oh. make vietnamese rolls and you know it's very high in protein very low in fat and that's because you know you've got your tofu whatever you decide to put in protein wise and for flavor herbs herbs Yum. are amazing fresh herbs you've got mint you've got basil chives scallions anything you put all of them in there and i guarantee you you won't miss out on the peanut sauce you won't miss out on wow. on all of the fatty components that, that sounds you know. amazing <laughs> and super healthy anytime you get your greens in that's come a good come one. over to dinner anytime <laughs> okay i'll take you on that. in terms of salt everyone knows that restaurants tend to pack a punch so why do restaurants use so much salt and how can you go around that if you wanted to so I'm going to tell you a little secret. Okay. The reason why we use so much salt is because we become immune to salt. After, oh, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, after so many years of cooking, you know, the more salt that you ingest, the less, you know, you taste it. And so when I first started at Spago, for example, I would see all the chefs coming around and saying, Deborah, this needs more salt. This needs more salt. And I was like, oh my God, 
it's already salty. Like, are you crazy? And, uh, you know, after a while, I realized what was happening was that they were just losing their ability to taste that salt. So when we put out a dish and the, you know, the client comes in and has it, you know, most of the time it's at that perfect level. For some people, it might be a little more salty, and that's the reason why. That's a really great point because some of my clients who have renal disorder or some other issue where they have to lower their salt, it's so hard for them at first. And even personally, when I was trying to wean down my salt intake, it, it does take getting used to, right. but then I find it is about training those taste buds. So you, I guess you could train them one way or the other. I would say the same with, with sugar. And you, Definitely. Know, you start cutting out sugar, you realize that some desserts are sweeter than you ever imagined. Totally. So you know. Always a good thing to wean down on sugar. <laughs> and I tell my clients, you know, you're not going to feel shaking, but it will feel right. like some sense of withdrawal and the difference of taste, right. for sure. So as a private caterer in Beverly Hills, have you ever had any wacky requests or dietary suggestions? I, as a chef, you know, I'm always looking for that creative edge. And for me, I want to go in there and create my avant-garde, you know, dish and put out something that, that you know, creates that facial expression that, that everyone wants. You know, they're, oh, what is this? I have no words to explain what I just ate. And, you know, I haven't had really wacky requests, but a lot of limitations. And that, as a chef, is very difficult. At the end of the day, I am there for them and to cater to them. Um, but, you know, it, it's difficult when you get requests like, low sodium, no soy, and at the end of the day, they're asking you to make Asian food. Right. So you say to yourself, Asian food without soy, that's, you know, like peanut butter without jelly. Right. How do you, you know, it, it just doesn't that. work. So what's a, like, if someone is allergic to, let's say, like peanuts, or like, what's a good example of how you can circumvent the situation and make people with intolerances, you know, enjoy food and not have to feel left out? I try to do my research. I try to go online. I try to see if there are any any sort of um, components that other chefs have found that work in those similar situations. You know, if it's a dairy intolerance, or you know, if it's low sodium, or anything, even the most intricate detail that you may never have heard of. I have yet to experience that, but you mm -hmm. know, it happens. And just do my research and see how I can best cater to them. Okay, that sounds good. Well, being that you have such a diverse background, I know there's like Israel, Morocco, <laughs> Venezuela, like there's so many countries in your repertoire and your travels. What are some of the flavor profiles that you tend to go to more often? More often, I like Moroccan and Spanish. If I could eat Spanish food every single day of my life, I would. I love the, the culture of tapa style. Um, you know, eating. I think that having family and friends around and small dishes and sort of like, you know, making the time of our conversation and, and, you know, kind of like eating small little bites. You don't feel so full afterwards. You feel right. able to get up and go on with the rest of your day. That's a great point. So tapas bars can be either really great for, you know, someone trying to control their weight or it can be kind of a nightmare. So if there are, let's say, four people at the table, how many tapas dishes are really appropriate so you don't overdo it and go home feeling like you overdid it. Well, if you go to Spain, for example, you'll see that people, you know, it, it's not like America where you eat and you go. Eating is, is a culture over there. Eating, people sit down and they'll really lend two hours to doing that. So they'll start off with, maybe there's five people at the table, start off with two or three things. Let's try these okay. cheeses, cheeses, some olives, a little wine. Then let's kind of see how that, you know, right. feels. Very different from the average American who sits down and like, Scarves it down. all over the place. Exactly. So that's a really good tip is that, you know, sit down, maybe start, like if you have five people minus two that Correct. for three, start there, see how you feel, and then go from there. I mean, I, you know best. It takes probably 20 minutes for your body to yeah, register absolutely. anything, right? So I think it's all about sort of gauging that and knowing your own body and knowing, you know, when, when to stop. And, you know, hey, I'm a chef. I'm all for flavor and for enjoying and, you know, even eating things that you probably shouldn't but in moderation and, you know. Right. With and that's what I was telling Deborah before the segment, is it's so impressive to me when a chef can make such delicious food and cook it in a healthy way, because that shows the true talent of cooking. You know, if someone makes something with so much butter and so much butter and so much salt and so much fat, I don't look at that as an art. I look at that as like, duh, with enough bacon and butter, it's gonna taste exactly. good. Exactly, trying to compensate for something else. But like when you can like really work the spices the way you do, it's really the talent. So thank Less you is so more. much for <laughs> no, coming pleasure, on today. Really. Thank you so much. And those are some really, really good tips that we can <laughs> use when trying to control our weight next time we go out. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you. For more on living healthy, living well, be sure to subscribe to EmpowerMe.tv. 
Follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. Thank you.